Well, welcome everybody to um, the launch event for um, community landowners and the climate emergency, uh, a report, research report um, produced by Inherit on behalf of Community Land Scotland. We're delighted to welcome so many people uh, to the event today. Um, I'm Callum McLeod, I'm Community Land Scotland's policy director. Um, been involved with the research along with many other colleagues uh, within Community Land Scotland working with Inherit on uh, this piece of work. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be able to launch uh, the report and the six associated case studies uh, that are linked to the, the research and also a short film as well which um, encapsulates a great deal of uh, what um, Chris Douglas and, and Bobby McCauley were working on on this project for us with uh, a huge range of different uh, groups, community landowners and other stakeholders as well. Um, so we're really pleased to have um, 111 people registered for this event today. We think it's going to be uh, certainly a very timely uh, a moment to be launching this uh, piece of research given uh, where we are with regard to uh, the climate emergency and the role of different um, stakeholders and players in relation to addressing that. So I'm going to very briefly just run through uh, the uh, programme for uh, this afternoon's event. So let me just do that with you just now and then we'll move on to uh, the, the order of business. So shortly I'm going to pass over to Community Land Scotland's Chair Ilsa Rayburn to formally welcome everybody to um, the launch and also to provide some introductory comments with regard to the research and, and why it's uh, significant from Community Land Scotland's perspective. I'm going to pass over to Nicholas Gubbins, the Chief Executive of uh, Community Energy Scotland, uh, who will give some uh, thoughts as well with regard to the, the broader significance of, of the research findings as well and why that uh, is important to, to the sector as a whole. Um, we'll then move on to a, the actual meat of the research itself and Chris Douglas and Bobby McCauley who've uh, produced this really fantastic uh, from our perspective piece of very rigorous uh, research will uh, talk about the key findings that have emerged from the work and before that um, we'll show a, a, a the short film that's been prepared as part of the the research outputs for the study as well. Um, and then we'll move on to a, the, the panel discussion where we'll be able to reflect in more detail on the um, findings from the research itself and the issues that really throws up for the challenges but also the opportunities that uh, may arise and will arise with regard to the role that community landowners both rural and urban have to play with regard to addressing what is really the existential challenge that we all face, that of the climate emergency. And so I'll chair that session uh, and we'll have um, contributions from our panellists who are Ilsa Rayburn, again from Community Land Scotland. We're delighted also to welcome uh, Hamish Trench, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Land Commission, uh, and Will Golding um, from Bridge End Farmhouse, board member of uh, Bridge End Farmhouse in Edinburgh. Um, and also Donald McKinnon, who is a, one of the development officers with a Carloway State Trust and is also a, the a chair of the Scottish Crofting Federation, relatively recently appointed chair of the, the, the Scottish Crofting Federation as well. And also Andrew McBride, uh, who runs and is, heads up the uh, Peatland Action Programme uh, with Nature Scott and indeed um, that is one of the case studies that features as part of our research. Um, we're due to a, have the session running through to 5 p.m. I suspect we are not going to be short of things to say and discuss within the um, next hour and a half. Uh, we will not go over 5 p.m. if we happen to finish beforehand hand, all well and good but as I say I suspect we have more than enough to discuss in relation to uh, this, this project, this research, and what it actually uh, means and, and throws up in terms of really important issues with regard to the connections between community landowners, the work they're doing, and the climate emergency. Um, so that's more than enough for me at the moment. We'll talk more about the, the, the panel discussion when we, we get to that. But let me pass on now to Ilsa Rayburn, uh, Community Land Scotland's Chair, to um, formally welcome everyone to the event. Thank you, Ilsa. Thanks very much, Ken. and can I...
Iron. Is that me? Have you unmuted me? Um, great. I'll start that spiel again. Um, echo Callum's welcome um, to everybody that's joined us today. And uh, great it is to see so many old and new faces here today, especially um, Will and um, Donald, um, who are some of our younger community landowners. It's great to be um, spreading this message through the generations. Fantastic. So thank you um, to them for joining us today. Um, as Cam's mentioned, this is a, it's an incredibly important topic. As we all move forward out of COVID into a, a recovery, how we respond to the climate emergency will be the top of everyone's agenda and COP26 coming to Glasgow in November will undoubtedly place further focus on how as, as Scotland as a country and now how as, as individual communities can meet our net zero targets. In this sector, I think we've all known for some time that communities were sort of quietly and determinedly working to address global climate issues at a very local level. But this knowledge always tended to be in silos and nowhere had, had the whole range of activity and drive and ambition in communities been brought together. Um, so nowhere had this ground up practical behavioural led change been collated to demonstrate the full extent of community leadership in the sector. And it's clear from our research that community landowners are punching well above their weight in both the depth and breadth and also the impact of their activity in addressing the climate emergency. So we're really pleased today to launch this really excellent report, Communities in the Climate Emergency. Is excellent due to the research work undertaken by Inherit and, and we've got huge thanks to give to Chris Dalgleish and Bobby McCauley. Um, excellent also due to the inspiring and, and committed partnership working within the sector to deliver it. So many, many thanks to John Hollingdale at Community Woodlands Association, Nicholas Gubbins at Community Energy Scotland, who you sure to hear from, and Jamie McIntyre at the Woodland Crofts Partnership. Um, they've all contributed hugely to steering this research and we're very grateful for their time and skills in doing that. And finally, thanks um, to the many, many communities who gave their time and input to the project, um, to the detailed research and the case studies, and also their contributions and thinking about how we move forward um, in this arena. So I'm going to pass you back to Callum after all those thanks. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the Q&A session and um, we've got some really interesting panelists so please make sure as we go through um, you're putting the questions in the Q&A box and, and let's make all those panelists earn their beans today by some difficult questions. So I'll pass you back to Callum um, who won't thank me for that um, and then speak to you later. Thanks Callum. Thanks very much indeed Ailsa. Um, along with the, the, the many kind of stakeholders and, and partners that we work with in producing this report, the other partner, of course, we need to um, acknowledge as well is, is the Scottish Government who provided funding uh, in support of producing the work as well. And we're very grateful for uh, the support they provide <coughs> in that regard too. Um, I'm going to pass on with, uh, without further ado to Nicholas Gubbins to uh, really just, Nicholas, hear your thoughts in terms of what you think the significance of, of the research is more broadly and, and um, any elements that you, you think are important in that regard, amongst many other things of, of note and interest that I'm sure you'll have to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Callum, and thanks very much for the opportunity to introduce what, what I think is a really a brilliant report. And as um, Elsa has said, a very diligent and thorough report too. <clears throat> so it's quite interesting to pause, I think, and think that about this time last year, in referring to the COVID pandemic, the novelist um, Arundhati Roy said that the tragedy is real, immediate, epic, and unfolding before our eyes. But it isn't new, it is the wreckage of a train that has been careening down the track for years. She said that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one's no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And she finished by saying that we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. I think it's worth just reflecting on that. COVID-19 has had a terrible impact but it's also provided us with a window of opportunity to rethink 
and to change how we're doing things. And I think we've done a lot of thinking over this period. This week, we've seen the culmination of some of this thinking. We've, we've just seen the Just Transition Commission's report, which was published yesterday. And the Scotland's Climate Assembly interim report was published today. And now we have this very timely report from Community Land Scotland. So the Just Transition Commission's report made a number of very interesting and strong statements. And I obviously won't go through them all, but the very relevant ones that I took out were comments such as, without broad-based support, and in particular, without the buy-in of workers and communities, progress towards net zero will not be achieved. And then its third recommendation, it stated that the need to empower and invigorate our communities and strengthen local economies. And, and states very clearly that a just transition will be shaped by Scotland's citizens and not imposed upon them. It has some very particular things to say about our land as well. It says that our land will be vital in delivering our climate change ambition. But flags that across Scotland, there's a common perception that land is not necessarily used in the best interests of communities. And it also emphasizes that there needs to be huge investment, such as in restoring peatlands, tree planting, woodland management, and so on. And that we need to ensure that the benefits that can arise from this are felt widely by rural communities. I would go on to say that it needs to be communities full stop, not just rural communities, of course. Um, if we just look at the Scotland's Climate Assembly interim report, they also note that there isn't a uniform solution to tackling the climate emergency across Scotland, and that there, they argue strongly about the need to empower local communities to be able to collaborate and drive changes, such as around infrastructure, service provision, land use, and the economy. And they also emphasize that this needs to be done in ways that will work in their place and facilitate localized living. It's also perhaps worth just mentioning that just at the end of last year, we had the Committee on Climate Change's sixth carbon budget published. And right up at the front, they emphasize that more than ever before, future emissions reductions will require people to be actively involved. This isn't purely a technocratic exercise. If we don't involve people, this is me saying this, uh, then we're doomed to fail. So these are high level statements. And I think it's fair to say that they really set out the practical ground level measures for achieving these outcomes. But whilst obviously strategic, bold government action is a prerequisite, there are a few better ways to drive the change changes that we need uh, than through community-led action. And this is amply illustrated in the report that we now have with us from Community Land Scotland today. So in the report, there are a few st striking points which stand out for me. These are just ones that stand out for me. There are actually lots of striking points. Um, firstly is that I think the sheer range of actions that community landowners are taking forward across key climate action sectors. So here we're talking about energy, transport, food, behavior change, and adaptation to climate impacts that are already upon us. And it illustrates these nicely through a set of case studies, which are great to read. The second is that how community landowners are uniquely placed to do this. It's no coincidence, for example, that many of the most significant community renewable energy developments are on community-owned estates. And then third, it refers to the, the ability of community landowners to engage local people and drive the all-important behavior changes that are urgently needed. And that chimes with the other reports that I just referred to earlier. And then finally, perhaps, a bit of a softer point, but one that to me you know, comes out time and time again is uh, what it demonstrates in terms of the competence, experience and skill which the sector demonstrates. And 
most importantly, the foundation that this provides for doing so much more. So I think this report gives us a bit of a glimpse through the portal that I referred to at the beginning. Um, but also, uh, it's very clear that we should not delay in driving forward its recommendations. So back to Callum for a bit more detail on the report itself. Thanks very much indeed, Nicholas, for um, your thoughts there. And you raise a number of really pertinent uh, and important issues, which I'm sure we're going to return to in uh, the panel discussion um, in, in a little while. Um, before we do that, let's move on to the, the I suppose, the heart of, of the event itself, which is to, to consider in a bit more detail the um, the research and, and the findings that emerge from, from the research. So in a, in a few moments, I'm just going to invite uh, Chris Douglish of Inherit to um, press play basically on the, on the short film that we have, which I think brilliantly encapsulates uh, the research findings um, in, in, in some detail. This is a, a nine minute film. I should put a slight health warning here at the moment because we are at the mercy of course, of um, the internet. So if you do happen to find that it chops up slightly or it stalls, uh, then I can, can I suggest that you do one of two things. One of which is I think it should, there should be a link to the film um, on the, in the chat box uh, on your screen. So if you want, you can click onto that and have a look at it, but keep an eye on, on, on the Zoom element itself. Alternatively, uh, you can also, of course, go on to Community Land Scotland's website and, and, and have a look at it from there. It's on social media as well. So uh, lots of different ways to view this really fantastic uh, film. I should just say as well, of course, uh, social media, if you are uh, looking to, to tweet in relation to this event, the hashtag is Community Land Climate. So please do uh, do that if you want to um, provide any comments or make any observations as we move along through the event itself. Um, but let's move on now and actually uh, sit back and, and enjoy this this film and then we'll we'll move on to listen here from um, Bobby and from Chris with regard to some of the findings too. So uh, Chris, let me pass over to you for that. Great, okay. Uh, just bear with me everyone for a couple of seconds. I'll, I'll set this running and share the screen.
we we live in an area where there's very 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 high levels of fuel poverty so we live in an area with energy energy use affects people we live in an area where we can see climate all around us people recognize changes and so are are seeing the effects firsthand of climate change so i think it's just because as a community we're so closely connected to that to energy and then we're so closely connected to climate that it just is so natural that so many of our projects are about that there there's a few examples um of pretty major life-changing sort of outcomes from that project we are people maybe just didn't quite know who to contact to get um, their windows upgraded to double glazing and um, getting pointed in the right direction to get insulation and uh, heating systems replaced. You know, things that that really changed people's lives and, and, and uh, how they were able to live in their houses. Sometimes you get a solution promoted by, you know, a sector, if you like, a private sector or or, or a public body whose primary focus is whatever, roads, traffic, transport, whereas a community will be thinking in the round and thinking about all of their needs and all of their aspirations and so on. So I think that's where communities could add value by saying, look, you know, well, that's fine, that might fix that, but actually we want a solution that, that gives multiple benefits. I want to get a message across I don't use a public body to do it I think the message is much better delivered by one of your own as it were one of the things that the development trust is very good at is is getting information out there if we get it across to everybody who comes to the forest you know that they have a personal responsibility because that's where it starts you know, your own personal responsibility, the choices you make, you know, how often you use your car, do you take a, do you go abroad, and do you fly, this sort of thing, how much technology do you buy every year? Those who study kind of climate change psychology and climate change communication can tell us that not only do we need to get the right words and the right vocabulary, but we need to have the right messengers for climate change. Um, the, the, the messages are quite stark, they're a little bit scary, and they're going to demand a change from everybody. In order for that message to land well, it needs to be communicated by people like like the audience, if you like. Um, so the, the, the changes that we need to make um, need to be shared, yes, by politicians and scientists, but actually people are looking out my window here in my community, the, the people that they're going to listen to and and give credibility to our their peers, their people who speak like them, people who look like them, people who talk like them. But I also think there's a strong theme that we probably haven't explored enough yet in Scotland about how the transition to a net zero economy and the changes in land use that go with that can actually benefit communities. Um, and if, you know, coming back to the theme of a just transition, um, we basically, we know we know there's going to be big land use change in Scotland over the next um, couple of decades to meet the climate targets. Um, the question is, how do we make sure that communities are actually benefiting and influencing and being part of that change rather than just watching it happen around them? A lot of what I would consider climate action wouldn't necessarily be labelled as that and doesn't necessarily save any carbon in the short term, but it's all about creating the sort of resilient communities we need in order to uh, create the transformational change which and structural changes that we need. Ultimately, it's not just about whether you're delivering climate targets. It's it's how are you doing that in a way that actually realizes all the opportunities along the way and um, all the you know, it, it, I mean we're, we're in you know, we're in a time where the whole focus is on green recovery so clearly we want to deliver these climate targets in a way that actually increases the resilience of local economies and local communities 
Um, and, and, and that's why how you do it matters, I think, perhaps more than just delivering the, the climate target itself. Callum. Knew that would happen sooner. Carry on, are you? Um, only a matter of time. Uh, thanks very much. That, again, that film, I think, encapsulates a great deal of um, what, what was um, undertaken and, and revealed in the study with regard to the relationship between community landowners, urban and rural, uh, and, and their um, ways of tackling the, the climate emergency itself. So before we go on to the panel discussion, um, I'd like to invite uh, Chris and, and Bobby just to dig a little bit deeper over the next sort of 10 minutes or so into the research findings and just to give us a little bit more context and uh, some discussion around those findings uh, before we, we move it and open it up to um, that discussion. So thank you, Chris. Thank you. And actually I'd like to begin myself with a few thank yous. I mean, firstly, thank you to uh, Stamos Abatis, who directed and edited that film, and Nikitas Grispos, who did, who's responsible for creating the sound and the music. They had a, they had a very difficult task that we gave them. I mean, producing a film like that in, in the course of a pandemic when they had to rely on whatever material we could gather and people generously supplied for this. Um, but I think they've done a, a really great job. It's a really great result. Um, I encourage you to go and watch it again in your own time and get the full effect. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to everyone who took part in the research. I mean, Bobby and I, I think we're both humbled by the response that it got. I mean, people have got plenty of things to be dealing with um, these, in these days. So, but we did get a really great response to our request for to take part. So I think it's just an indication of how much this, this subject matters to people and how much they wanted to share their stories about how, how they're, how they're addressing, addressing the climate emergency through their work. Um, the different elements of the research, we, so we ran an online survey which um, 53 community organisations responded to and in the end 46 of those we included in the, the sample as meeting our definition of community landowners and that represents something like 11% of the community landowning sector so we feel that's a quite a solid response and that's across 13 local authority areas in Scotland so it's, it's a widespread urban rural in many different parts of the country. Um, many of those also responded to our follow-up requests uh, for, for further information beyond the survey, so they really put in, uh, went the extra mile for this. We also, um, as has been mentioned already today, we, we carried out six case studies, uh, researched six case studies, um, each focused on a particular community landowner and the work they're, they're doing, uh, Carloway Estate Trust, the Isla Pia Heritage Trust, Huntley Development Trust, the Break and Forest Trust, um, Lister Housing Cooperative in Edinburgh, uh, Clear in Buckhaven and Methil in Fife. So many people took part in interviews for those case studies and without that we wouldn't have been able to, to get the richness of information that we were able to, to, to put together um, in sharing those stories. And finally we, we did um, a range of interviews with people who, who have a sort of more national remit let's say. Um, we ran a focus group with the, um, uh, the, the, the organisations involved in steering the project, so Community Land Scotland, Community Woodlands Association, Community Energy Scotland uh, and the Wooden Cross Partnership, but also interviews with people from uh, the Scottish Community Climate, Climate Action Network, uh, Scottish Community Alliance, Keep Scotland Beautiful, Scottish Land Commission, uh, Nature Scott and, and Professor Mike Danson from the Just Transition Commission. So taking that all together, that gave us a really good range of 
inputs, information and different perspectives, which was what allowed us, I think, to get this quite robust and systematic uh, insight into what's been happening. There were maybe three main things, I think, that we were trying to achieve through the research. The first, um, well, it was, it was a three month piece of work. It was in the scale of things quite rapid, but we, we think we, we did a systematic and robust job with, with the evidence that we had. Um, and the first main thing that we were trying to achieve through that was really to map out what community landowners are doing. Um, it became very clear to us that this is a vibrant, diverse, dynamic uh, a, a field of action. Uh, the range of things that community owners are doing, the diversity of it is, is really quite something. So even for those involved, it, been quite, it can be quite difficult to get a handle on, on, on what's going on beyond your own, your own patch. So the first job is really just to, to, to try and map that out and get a sense, an overview of what was happening. The second thing, um, and I think this is where many of the key, the key findings come through, uh, we wanted to understand the character of the contribution that community landowners are making to addressing the climate emergency. So what's the distinctive nature of the approach that community landowners take that many others uh, don't take or can't take um, uh, to the same, the same kind of objectives? What are the particular benefits that community landowners can provide um, in taking action on the climate that, that maybe others um, can't? So that distinctive contribution was a big focus of what we were looking at. And finally, the third thing we were trying to do was to assess the potential for, uh, for future contributions. What's the potential for community landowners to contribute in the future, in the coming years? And what might help to enable uh, that, that greater contribution? So that's a sense of what we we're trying to do. If I can hand over to you, Bobby, now to, to run us through what we felt were the main, the main findings from the work. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, and just quickly to, to echo Chris's words of, of thanks to everyone that, that took part in the research. Uh, I'm sure some of you are sick of the sight of my, my face and my emails in your inbox, but uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to fly through some of the of the main conclusions of the work, uh, some of which have been have been touched upon by, by Nicholas and Elsa and, and also in the film. Uh, with regard to, to the range of climate related activities and, and their benefits within communities, uh, as you saw in the video there, the, there were six identified sectors of, of climate action, uh, which were engaged with, with uh, by, by a wide variety of, of organizations. So community owners were involved in uh, renewable energy generation, uh, development or restoration of carbon sinks. So whether that's woodland, peatland or other green spaces, um, reduction of, of carbon emissions related to transport, food and, and domestic consumption, uh, and also education and adaptation to, to kind of prepare for, for climate changes. Uh, what we found was that uh, as well as engaging in, in these uh, sectors, community owners often work across them as well, uh, with, with over half of respondents engaged in more than one of those activities. So this kind of gave us a sense of, of a broad and holistic approach to, to climate action. Um, the case studies that, that accompany the research report are actually great examples of this because the, the case studies all focus on one particular sector uh, but also detail the other climate related initiatives uh, that, that the organizations are engaged in and, and give kind of more of a practical sense of how and why climate action was, was undertaken and how that's affected local people. And that aspect of, of local impact was another important finding of the research in terms of uh, respondents reported a wide range of community benefits related to climate action, which had nothing to do with the climate. Uh, and this included generating income from renew renewable energy, which was then reinvested in the community, and various projects and initiatives which led to increased community empowerment, cohesion, and voluntary activity, as well as more individual outcomes um, related to improved education, skills, and, and health of local people. And these benefits were related to the fact that community owners have, have a responsibility to improve conditions for local people. So sometimes climate-related activity wasn't always labeled as such, nor, nor was the primary aim always environmentally focused. But there's often another social or economic priority which was being pursued alongside reducing climate emissions, leading to these multiple benefits. Uh, Sally mentioned in, in the film there uh, that reducing fuel poverty was, was a priority which goes alongside reducing domestic emissions. So that's an example of a kind of social and economic benefit alongside a, a climate one. 
And so just because climate ne wasn't necessarily the, the reason that these things were pursued, doesn't mean it didn't have a climate related benefit. Secondly, what we wanted to look was one, one kind of level deeper at, at whether the contribution of community owners to addressing the climate emergency was in any way distinctive or, or what the added value of that contribution might be. So what we found was that the trust and credibility built up through regular communication with local people and a track record of successful community development activities led to a position of local leadership of these organizations. And when this leadership was applied to climate related initiatives, as well as its immediate effects on reducing emissions, it established new norms within communities, encouraging engagement in those climate action activities, as well as individual behavior change. Now, this relates to a point made a few times in, in the report and by others that, that while technological and land use changes are clearly important in tackling the climate emergency, addressing it is not just a technical matter, it's a matter of social change too. And it's community organizations that were considered best place to affect that change at the local level. And this leaves an, an educational and behavioral legacy around environmental awareness in communities where climate action becomes mainstream and normalized and communities feel empowered and committed to tackling the climate emergency. Now these points relate to climate, uh, sorry, community-based climate action which may not be directly related to a community-owned asset. So how and why does asset ownership matter? In some instances, these actions could be undertaken without owning assets, but our, finding in, uh, our findings indicate that asset ownership makes life much easier. In terms of, I mean, first, asset ownership can greatly enhance the financial situation and independence of, of community organizations, meaning that they can engage in long-term planning around investments and in infrastructure and, and energy efficiency, um, and also human resources, uh, which, which usually means that they can achieve more in, in a variety of, of fields. Second, asset ownership gives access and control. Uh, almost all of these activities need some land to do things on. And while this land could theoretically be, be leased, this constrains the activities and benefits, whether climate related or otherwise, which can be generated by them. So ultimately with ownership, the community doesn't need to ask permission from a landowner to engage in climate related activity. And so the chances of being constrained in their climate ambitions are substantially reduced. And then the third point about asset ownership relates to its democratic accountability. Local people are engaged and ultimately responsible for how the land or asset is used. And so they play an active role in defining the activities undertaken. And this last point leads us on nicely to speaking about the just transition. Now the concept of just transition is that people should be able to have a say in and benefit from the societal changes we have to make to reach net zero. Now, thinking back to the themes in the film, these are all activities which private sector and, and, and other sectors are engaged in, sometimes on much larger scales. But community owners are different in that they are subject to local democratic accountability. So people, local people are in charge of their actions. And they're bound to ensure that the actions are taken in the interests of local people. So the community enjoys the benefits. So alongside their ability to encourage behavior change in ways that many other types of organizations cannot, community owners are distinctive in their ability to play a significant role in tackling the climate emergency and delivering a just transition locally. And all these elements improve the resilience of local communities. Resilient communities are capable of coping with external shocks, whether climate related or, or, or otherwise. And therefore, Investments in communities delivering climate action now will build a legacy of capability and empowerment for communities to assume similar responsibility for other functions in the future and to cope with the climate changes which that future may bring. So finally, the, the research also identified three main ways in which community owners can be enabled to make a greater contribution in the future. Uh, these are points that I'm fairly sure that panel members will want to pick up on. So I'll, I'll just mention them very briefly here. They are to expand the extent of community ownership, to improve partnerships and collaboration with other sectors, 
and to improve and simplify funding support. And so with that, that's me. So thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Bobby, and, and, and to you, Chris, for a, a very comprehensive and succinct um, summary of the, the key points that have arisen from, from the research itself. We're, we're very grateful to you for that. Um, I'd like to move now on to the final part of our event, which is to have um, a, a panel discussion around some of the themes that are, and issues that are raised uh, in the research itself. And I'm really delighted that we're able to be joined here by a, a number of different people who bring their own particular insights and expertise onto the issues uh, that, that are at hand at the moment. So I'm pleased to welcome, uh, first of all, Ilsa Rayburn, our, our chair, who you've committed on Scotland's chair, who you've, you've obviously heard uh, from earlier on. Um, also, Donald McKinnon uh, of the Carloway Estate Trust and indeed the Scottish Crofting. Federation, Hamish Trench of the uh, Scottish Land Commission, Chief Executive there, Andrew McBride, who heads up the um, Peatland Action Programme um, within uh, Nature Scott, uh, and also Will Golding, um, who is on the board of Bridgend Farmhouse in, in Edinburgh. So um, please do, uh, folks that are, are, are listening and watching, uh, please do uh, use the Q&A uh, function to um, send any questions that you'd like the panel to consider uh, as we go through the, the last part of this, this session. I've got a few questions up my own sleeve that we can use to, to keep things moving along as well, but if anybody does have any questions or points they want to raise, please do use that Q&A uh, function to do that. But before we go on to the questions themselves, um, I'd like to give all of the panelists just a, a few moments to, to briefly give us their own reflections on, on the research and its findings before we move on to the, uh, the substance of questions and, and, and the, the many issues that I'm sure we'll be discussing over the next uh, little while. So can I first of all invite Ilsa to do that and, and give some thoughts first of all and then we'll move on to other colleagues as well. Thanks Callum. Um, yeah, that was a great film um, uh, and, and really interesting to get that detail from Chris and Bobby. And I think what's come across really clearly um, from the research is what's driving community owners and it is that holistic approach. So it's got to be something that's good for their community. It's got to address the fundamental needs of their community. It's got to contribute to climate mitigation and it's got to help influence behaviour change and, that, and that's what's driving them. Um, and, you know, community owners are not driven by subsidies or income generation or adding value to their estates or assets. Um, and I think that's what comes across really starkly um, in some of that. Um, I don't want to talk too long, but you'll expect me to go off piece slightly. Um, Bobby um, McCauley did a great blog, which is on the CLS website this morning, and there was a really great phrase in it. There are no Hollywood movies of the hero hoovering up all the nasty carbon in the nick of time. Um, and I think that really represents what community led action is all about. It's all about us having to do stuff. It's all about us having to change the way that we're living. I think we know that is it 60 to 70 percent of of all action needs to be individual action. Large NGOs and agencies can't do it on their own and large landowners can't do it on their own. It requires that societal change and I think that's really what, what the report is helping to show us. What it's also showing is, is that community landowners can do all the stuff that other people can do so we can do what governments and NGOs and businesses do but we can also add that extra value and I think that's what's really important to us come out in the in the research um, I think the final sort of really quick point I'd like to make which is the going off piece slightly is is reference which needs there which bears repeating again and again and again Savile's um, insights report that came out last week just last week the 16th of March entitled a new era for the Scottish estate with a surge in green buyers um, and these newly perceived attributes are enhancing the appeal of Scottish estates and their subsequent value there's been a 98 percent increase in buyers registering with Savile's to purchase rural property in Scotland. There's funds of almost £5 billion globally chasing Scottish rural property. Around half of the estates don't even come to the open market and these are all for entrants looking to buy land for their green credentials. 
and they talk about a seemingly insatiable demand for planting trees, which anybody that lives in a rural area will be really cognizant of. Um, and I'd just like to, to finish with their, their final quote. Scotland is one of the few remaining places in the world where green resources can be acquired on a meaningful scale by the private sector. So when we've established beyond doubt today with this report from Inherit in the ways in which communities can address and are addressing the climate crisis, I think one of the big questions for us, everyone attending today is, is what do we all think the impact of that increasing concentration of land ownership and, and ownership of Scotland's natural capital in a few very wealthy hands of global investors, what impact is that going to have on our just transition to a net zero economy? So sorry, Callum, I've gone a bit off piece there, but I think it's something is the next steps that we need to be looking at as part of this whole debate. Thanks very much, Elsa. Uh, really um, fantastic insights there. You don't have to apologise for going off piece at all. Community Land Scotland spent the last 10 years going off piece. Uh, not necessarily to everybody's delight, but we're, we're, we're going to keep doing it, I'm sure, in terms of um, challenging um, structures and so on. Um, thanks very much indeed for that. Can I, I'm just going to go around my screen as I see it here. So I'm going to pass over to Donald next to give some initial thoughts as well. Donald, can, can I pass over to you, Cheryl? Thanks, Callum. Um, yeah, I, I think this report's um, a fantastic resource um, to begin with. Um, uh, as, uh, along with the video as well, and in particular the case studies, I think, which are just so powerful. Um, and I think all show um, so, so much variety of activity that's going on out there. And just pick up on what Bobby was saying there in, in his remarks about the, the findings, about how um, the, the activities aren't necessarily, um, they're not set out to be just about climate change. They're about so much more than that, and I think that speaks to um, what us as community landowners have to have to do when we're coming up with projects, which is our projects have to deliver on lots of different fronts. We have to be meeting our strategic ob objectives as organisations, but delivering on um, social outcomes and 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 not to be forgotten economic outcomes as well to make our, our trusts financially sustainable um, so that we, we can continue to operate. And then, but what's brilliant about the report and what it reveals is that in doing all those things, tr uh, land trusts across the country are managing to also contribute to uh, the, um, mitigating climate change and, and tackling the climate emergency. Um, and I think it's going to be a powerful resource to show uh, government and show organi other organisations involved in these discussions um, that, that, that we are an important part of that uh, journey that Scotland has to go on now um, and, and that we're an important part of the, the solution. Um, I also think that as a, as a development worker, um, it's, it's so great to see all of these, all, all that variety of activity um, to give us ideas about what we can do in, in, our, in our own trust. And it's, it's maybe something that's been uh, missing a wee bit in the past year has been that uh, networking with uh, other landowners uh, and, and other development trusts around the country and finding out what's, what people are up to. And it's, it's always good to get ideas and, and learn from each other, because I think that's one of the great things about the sector is the, the sharing of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, and I hope that that's something that comes out of this work as well. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Donald. I think, again, all, all very prescient points. I'm particularly struck by the point you've just made there about uh, the, the kind of sharing and exchange of knowledge and, and, and practice and so on. I mean, that's one of the things that you're from the Western Isles, I am too, although you're from Lewis, I'm from Harris, we'll let that pass. Um, but the, you know, there's, there's, there's something there in terms of what's been happening in the Western Isles, isn't there, in terms of, of Estates taking ownership, uh, communities taking ownership of, of, of the states and, and, and sharing that kind of knowledge and seeing what's possible and the art of the possible within um, uh, the, the confines within which they're working. So I think that's a really important point and something uh, as you picked up and something we'll look to, to, to build on certainly in terms of this report and how we use it. Uh, let's move on and uh, get a, a perspective from, from Andrew from, uh, from Nature Scott. And, and, and obviously, Andrew, you've been involved. Uh, very extensively, of course, with the, with with Carloway and some of the other um, a community landowners as well uh, in relation to peatlands restoration. We'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon that in, in the, the ensuing conversation, but really interested to get your initial reflections on the research before we do that. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Carl. 
Um, I think one, one of the key things for me, and I, I agree totally with you, Donald, is that the case studies, there, there are absolute gold dust because those case studies are so good for inspiring other people and informing people, but also making a much wider audience aware of what actually can be done. Because I think very often, particularly in remote areas, people are not sure what's actually happening. And to actually have case studies like that from, from our perspective is, is really sort of strong and valuable tool. I think also the other thing that we find with peatland restoration is um, is demonstration as well, and that, that's that's why in local areas we actually try and encourage sites where people can visit. And for Lewis is a good example of that, where we've got sites where not many sites yet, but that's increasing as as people um, where people can go and see what a lot of things that sometimes are, are new sort of ideas or different ways of doing things can actually see what it looks like and often that that, that helps a lot and I think the, the, just the fact of having the case study is really a really strong tool. Great, Th thanks very much Andrew and again completely endorse that they're, they're really um, an important resource in terms of just uh, illustrating what, what uh, such a diverse range of uh, community organisations are doing in relation to, to this overarching issue, certainly. You're, you're absolutely right to say that. Um, can I move on to, to one of our other uh, com embedded community uh, representatives as well, and that's that's Will uh, from Bridgend Farmhouse. Now, Will, before we came on to the, the event, uh, we were talking about the fact that this is a day of celebration for Bridgend Farmhouse, is it not? Absolutely. Today is the third birthday uh, since we opened as a community hub. So. Um, so for us, it's a really uh, special day. Um, and um, although we've been going 10 years, we've been community owner for five years, you know, it's, that's when it really you know, came to life um, when, we, when we opened uh, with a big Kaylee three years ago. So yes, it's a real honor to be uh, here today. And, and it's a testament to a huge amount of work of, from our staff and volunteers and members to, to, to be able to kind of engage in these discussions and be part of this uh, as movement, I suppose. So yes. Um, so, so, um, <laughs> well, I say a few things about, yeah, uh, just, um, I, I mean, uh, yeah, a couple of things that stood out to me in terms of some quotes. One was from Angus Hardy there, it was about, and this is for the urban context, creating the building blocks of change that is needed. Um, and another was from the Community Led Environmental Action Group in Methyl in Buckhaven, which is about understanding the value of nature in our everyday experience. And I feel like those two things struck accord with me a little bit in terms of the role that urban community land owners are playing um, and came out of the report um, uh, in terms of um, awareness, education, um, but building on um, you know, the, the development of communities and relationships um, in terms of their links with environmental action um, and making, making that part of um, just improving the quality of lives within our communities. Um, the, 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 there was a thing called the Common Cause Handbook, which came out in 2011. It was about the, how, how behavioural change is possible within values and frameworks around climate change. And it focused on intrinsic values that we, that we have, you know, um, uh, family and, and, uh, and community and um, uh, a relationship with nature and, um, rather than money or, or, you know, saving money or, or things like this and, and, and status. And so I thought that drew, drew that out really well and uh, it was just very impressive to see the diversity of contributions all across Scotland um, and the strength of civil society that played played into that. I think there's, I think the Development Trust Association would say there's very little um, community owned businesses that have gone bust you know which you know um, in terms of uh, you know private businesses it's probably a stark contrast and it's a good example of um, how, how sustainable community-owned organisations can be, um, um, and also how what a value for money uh, you know you can what the the, the, the public sector will get through community-led organisations. Um, but I just I suppose I just want to also point out the, the 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 enormous amount of effort that goes into that you know the volunteer hours um, and the relationship building that takes time and that. Um, the inclusion within that that takes a lot of support and, and investment is is needed and and to sustain that and um, to support it and to kind of continually try to reach out which is something that we're ever trying to do and, and need, ever needing to improve as well you know it's messy it takes time it you, you know you can 
have conflicts or mistakes and things like that. Uh, but I think that's all part of the process. Um, and um, and whilst also focusing on um, the, the, those personal experiences um, and uh, making that possible, it's also looking at what role do we play within the wider network. And that was like what Donald was saying, that's quite exciting to then try to link up and see how other organizations, community landowners are doing this and, and to be part of that and to, to tie the, sort of join up the dots. Um, but um, yeah, la lastly, just to mention, um, it's, it's kind of been said already, but about the importance of, of ownership within that and how um, you know, it does enable um, a sort of agency um, which, which just brings out the potential and the care that people have for their communities and their environment and how that ties together. Um, and the, ultimately, I suppose it's about um, caring for our own generation, but many future generations and our planet. And, and, and I'd say, you know, 99% of people do, but sometimes um, certain structures or systems don't enable us to act as easily on that. So community island ownership does certainly create more opportunities to do that. Um, so um, that is probably the main things I would like to say um, at this point. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Well, I'm more more than more than sufficient in terms of some really fantastic points that you make there, and, and uh, such an important one to end on as well. And in, in terms of the, the the need to have good stewardship and sustainable stewardship of the planet and the resources for future generations. Uh, if that's uh, not significantly what sustainable development about is is about I'm, I'm not sure what is uh, you also made i think some really interesting points there about the, the, the just reconnecting with nature and with the land as well and you're doing that brilliantly uh, within bridge and farmhouse with regard to the, the the work that you're doing in your allotments and, and other dimensions to that as well so that's that's great and we were really pleased to to make sure that you you featured in the in the in the the film as well and in, in terms of some of the footage here so that was that was fantastic um last but by absolutely no means least before we move on to the the questions uh, that folks have been uh, putting in into to consider um hamish can i uh, finish with just your own thoughts as well on on the, on the research and, and where that might be taking us thanks thanks Callum. yes um, yeah, I, I really do think this is a kind of really timely and very useful um, report and bit of research. Um, I think, as I, as I said in the film clip, there's no question that we've kind of got a decade of change ahead of us now. Um, the question really is, can we make the most of it? And, and can we realise the kind of the opportunities that come along with that? Um, so I think some initial thoughts on the report, three things that strike me in particular are really the, the way it shows the, you know, the, the powerful value of drawing on established community networks. And, and the power that can bring to actually getting stuff delivered and getting climate action delivered um, on the ground where it matters. Um, you know, that is that is absolutely what government is looking for in, in this whole approach to, to delivery, um, just transition um, and delivering in, in places. I think, you know, leading on from that, we've, um, Nicholas at the start, kind of referenced the just, kind of just Transition report and the, and the significance of that. And I think the, the case studies here, you know, demonstrate what that looks like in practice. Um, so, so we're seeing here what a just transmission looks like on the ground. Um, and I think really that leads on to, to the leadership role um, that the community land leadership sector has here, not, not just in delivering um, within community owned land um, and delivering kind of on the climate agenda in that. But I also wonder, I, I think it's worth just thinking about how, how do you as a sector, how does everyone, um, how do you use that influence, that insight and experience that is, is very evident in the case studies in the report here? To influence some of the wider questions and some of the wider um, direction um, of the land use change that we're going to see around us um, over the next few years. And the points they also raised, for example, around some of the emerging issues in, in land values and, and land markets, um, I think are part of that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I would uh, hold the floor now. I'm very happy to say a bit more about some of, the, some of the work that we and others are doing that I think might be relevant to some of those issues. Uh, and I can see the same things coming up in the Q&A. So I'm sure we'll probably come back to that in the discussion. But I, but I think there is a huge leadership role here for the community land ownership sector uh, and influencing some of the wider change um, flowing from this. Thanks very much indeed, Hamish. I think you're, you're absolutely right there in terms of the, the, the leadership role and, and where the community land sector and asset sector has, has a, a fundamental and, and significant role to play in that. And I'm sure we will, as you say, come back to some of the issues that are pertinent to this in which the Land Commission is very much engaged in 
uh, as, as we go. Let's move on. I'm, I'm pleased to see that we're, we're getting a healthy kind of return in terms of the, the, the questions coming through now. So let's move to that uh, and, and consider, uh, invite the panel to consider some of the questions that are, are, are coming uh, through in relation to that. I'm going to take them in order of service. Some of them are quite specific. Some of them are pretty large scale. So uh, we could probably have a three day conference on some of them. Uh, but let's let's take them as they come anyway. The first from Nick Marshall. Um, should there be a small scale sawmill in every community that provides timber for local builders and manufacturers uh, that would require higher quality timber from better managed more diverse forests and what would the carbon implications be of that and he does go on further on to uh, say that there are good examples of, of exactly those types of um, activities going on in, in different areas in, in predominantly rural Scotland of course and does anyone have any any thoughts on the merits or otherwise of small scale, small, uh, that's not easy to say, small scale sawmills uh, in, in every community. Any thoughts? Hi, I'll jump in there, Callum, it's Elsa. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know really anything about sawmills, um, but I think what, what it demonstrates from the examples given at, at Kilfinnan um, and then the other example given is how communities are looking what the opportunities are in their area, looking what assets they've got, looking what the needs are, and then thinking, right, how do we as a community set up a business to develop this and we're seeing that across all communities all across Scotland and um, so whether that's a sawmill or whether it's seaweed or whether it's housing or, or whatever it is I think there's a there's a fantastic demonstration if you look for any sort of type of rural business you'll probably find a community running it somewhere because because they've identified a need in their community, they've identified an asset, and they've got the, the wherewithal and the entrepreneurial spirit and the get up and go to just go and do it. Um, so I think sawmills are a great example of where we can be using our natural capital to create that circular economy. And it's something that we talk about quite a lot in Community Land Scotland about the extractive economy and big businesses coming in and extracting all the resources and taking all the benefit from our local natural capital and how we actually can keep that locally in sawmills would be a great example of that but that's just one of many examples I think where communities are sort of seeing the light and realizing that they they need to do it before someone else comes in and does it and takes that natural capital away from them. Absolutely thanks very much Elsa, um, for that. Uh, Andrew you wanted to come in too I think. Yeah just quickly it I think it's probably up to us all to sort of raise well think much more about local local resources when we're doing projects and I'll give you an example in Peatland Action or several examples where we've actually used um, local timber for making dams in our peatlands and used not local sawmill but used mobile sawmills to actually do that and I think if we can start thinking along those lines as project developers then it, it helps everybody if you can just get into that and then, and then businesses can develop from that basically absolutely that whole kind of localized circular economy is a really important dimension to all of that certainly yeah uh, does anybody else want to 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 comment specifically on on some of the issues that have been raised just by that very one single question i'm going to assume not in that case and move on to thank you very much nick for what was a, a, a very um important question in relation to just the localized characteristics of economies. Let's move the focus now then to uh, the, the much bigger picture. And as we all know, the, the Just Transition Commission uh, published its long awaited report yesterday, had an awful lot of interesting things to say about all sorts of different sectoral issues, but had some very interesting things indeed to say around uh, the role of land use and how we who benefits from that and how they benefit from it uh, in terms of taking us towards that just transition to a, a net zero carbon economy. And my predecessor, uh, as, he, as he so often does, has come up with a very prescient question, Peter Peacock, um, who says the Just Transition, Transition Commission has stresses that transition is required to deliver opportunities for people, impaired communities, strengthen local economies, and ensure that benefits are shared widely. Yet we know that land in Scotland is being marketed for sale for its climate sequestration and earnings related potential. The super rich and corporates are likely to buy much of that land. And the question is, is a just transition in such circumstances really possible or is further reform to secure community interests to participate in climate solutions now urgent? So that's really, I suppose, an invitation for a call to action uh, from policymakers and others with regard to that. And it speaks, I think, to the point that Ilsa was making around the tensions and dynamics with regard to 
uh, the new green layers and what that might mean in terms of our just transition process. Let me throw it open to the panel and see who wants to dive in there. Callum, I'm happy to happy to share some thoughts on this first. So I think um, I think it is. I mean, it's very much an issue on the on the land commission's radar at the moment in terms of the likely implications for land markets and, and land values. Um, and I think we do have to recognise that with with new kind of investment models and new emerging values, there are some real risks here. So I think I think we do have a window of opportunity now to shape how some of these new um, models that are coming into the land market will work and will operate. Um, and will actually ensure local benefit um, and the economic benefit being retained locally. I think, I mean, there's no question that, you know, Scotland as a whole is going to need private investment um, in its climate action. So the challenge, as I see it, is, is to make sure that we do that in a way that actually brings together um, the sectors, uh, ensures that the economic benefits are retained locally in communities and local economies, and, and certainly not extracted either locally or even from the Scottish economy, as I think is a risk um, with some financial models as well. Um, and, and it also strikes me that, you know, that there are several ways to look at this. So work that the Land Commission is, is looking at at the moment, there are, I think, at least three ways into this that I can see. Um, obviously, we're looking at the land ownership aspect itself, um, and it's really interesting and, and really welcome to see the Just Transition yesterday. Um, you know, one of their recommendations was very clearly around the a, a public interest test for significant land transfers um, based on the proposals that the Land Commission put forward just um, a couple of months ago. So there's something fundamental about the, the ownership uh, and, the, and the responsibility of ownership that goes with that. I think the second area is work we're looking at in relation to tax uh, and what is a fair approach to tax that actually um, ensures the benefits are widely distributed um, of, of emerging values. Um, and the third area is good practice. Um, and I think there is a window of opportunity now, uh, you know, in line with the land rights and responsibility statement to be shaping what, what the responsible approaches to these new investment forms, green finance, look like in a Scottish context. And I suppose I would just, just finish there by saying we do have a really good framework for this in the land rights and responsibility statement. Um, so let's use it. You know, let, let's put that into practice and work out what does that look like um, in the context of these new emerging values in the market. Thanks very much, Hamish. Loads to kind of think about there in terms of the different dimensions of, of the work that you're doing within the Commission that also has clear connections in relation to this, these broader structural issues and, and, and where the market is taking us at the moment with regard to these issues. And can I invite any other comments with regard to, to this particular question that's been raised by Peter? Can I just come in there, Colin? Of course, yes. Yeah, I, th I think this, this sort of um, part of the debate raises some really interesting questions around um, carbon credits and the sort of trading of these um, uh, carbon commodities and things like that. And, and, and I think that the really crucial thing there is that um, in, in, a, in a certain regard that 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 that, that market is uh, being used by uh, large corporations to um, get off the hook, basically, and in dealing with their own carbon footprint. And I think we've got to be really careful that, that the actual um, net impact on the on carbon emissions is is correct and is is actually a real thing that is being achieved and and it's obviously going to have a, a, a major impact on on our uh, the land market as well if, if it is distorted in that way by companies but buying up estates like we're, we're seeing happening already and i think the other thing um to consider around this is um competing land uses as well and um it may not be um uh, community land as such but the the there is there is definitely a, a conflict emerging between um the large-scale planting of forestry and and some other um forms of land uh, tenure and use like the the tenanted sheep sector in the south of scotland that i think are we're seeing we're seeing a lot of conflict there between those two land uses developing and, and uh, certainly needs to be a discussion on how that develops absolutely Th thanks very much um any other any other comments before I maybe come to people on the panel directly to to get their thoughts because I think there's quite a lot of issues here that we can kind of tie into. And that, like I said, I'm going to come to Andrew on a, on a related point. Andrew, peatlands restoration and management. It's mentioned obviously in the the Just Transition Commission's report yesterday and the huge investment that's going to be going into to that. 
Um, and I saw you give a, a really excellent presentation at the Peatland Summit that um, the Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham uh, hosted back in December, which is very much around the, the state of the sector, as it were, and some of the challenges and opportunities that, that lie in, 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 uh, to be taken up there. And I just wonder, uh, just within the context of that broader question that Peter has asked there about the, the kind of dynamics of the market, are there particular ways in which uh, we can think about how to encourage more of the good work that has been documented, as you said, like gold dust in, in the, the, the Carloway case study, but also more widely where uh, communities do have an opportunity to uh, take more of a, a leading role and engage in the whole peatland management and restoration agenda as part of the bigger climate change agenda? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the scope, the potential scope for that, and I think I mentioned the the, the um, Pete and Summit, the, the Scottish government, for example, own about I think it's over half a million hectares of peatlands, which is is crofted land, and so that that in itself is 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 a, a major opportunity from the carbon sequestration point of view, but the peatland restoration point of view. So I think it's it's how we sort of mobilise that, and I think one of the things that we find it's it's actually um sort of it's being able to be coordinated on on a large scale because the, the, with a large amount of restoration that we need to do we need to do things on a very large scale and i think in community land ownership the larger the scale the better from the point of view of being able to access grants but also the emerging carbon markets it's it's very difficult for communities or, or or smaller landowners in particular to know exactly what to do and i i think it's it's about trying to actually clarify what what is actually happening from the point of view of carbon but also from the point of view of agri environment schemes and 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 what rewards for actually doing good land management will be in the future and i think i think again it's something that we need to come together on to actually clarify so people can make those decisions and some of those decisions will be quite long term you can be talking 30 100 years potentially so i think there's there's a lot of scope to actually get clarification quickly as possible actually thanks very much indeed uh, for that andrew i think you're right in terms of the the, the need to to engage with this really fast-paced agenda and in, in, in uh, innovative ways and, and connect that up Ilse, you wanted to come to uh, come in too i think yeah, just a, a really quick response to Andrew there. And, and there's a live case at the moment that I'm aware of where a community um, with woodland assets have been um, approached um, to enter into a carbon offsetting deal. Um, and um, I don't think any of us are, are really aware of what's involved with that and tying up an asset. We're being, it's being proposed to tie up this asset for 100 years with a conservation burden. Um, and yes, there's money involved and, and communities quite often are, are you know, uh, are always looking for new sources of income to help them with other projects that they want to do. So I think if, if someone like Nature Scott and, and other people in the sector were able to provide that guidance and leadership to communities, I think you'd find there's a huge resource out there, but it's really complex. And it's actually seems to be quite expensive to even get your scheme validated and the legal fees involved in getting a scheme set up, for, you know, um, are really expensive. And as you say, it needs to be a certain area of land that um, will make it worthwhile. So I think whatever Nature Scott were able to do in terms of working with, say, Community Land Scotland to draw attention to what the opportunities are, but what some of the potential sort of obligations are, I think that would be a great outcome of this discussion. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, it's one of the things we're working with uh, carbon markets at the moment to actually get guidance that is is understandable by most people because to be honest I can't understand it and I'm quite close to it and it, it is quite it's very complex and I think we need to get it just let's let's, let's get it to a level where we, we can all understand what everybody's talking about and I, I think one of my concerns is that people sell their carbon credits too early on in the process as well because the, once you've sold them then you haven't got them and I think uh, I think communities be, need to be careful about that it's about long long-term income you would hope they were looking for. Indeed, so and Andrew, if you're struggling, then we're all struggling, quite frankly, in relation to all of this. So, uh, but, but but we look forward to to to, to that extending that uh, that relationship in, in, in the ways that Ilse has just mentioned. That that would be very very productive. Um, I want to move the focus on now to uh, a question from uh, Adam Kalo from James Hutton Institute, and Adam's uh, question is this: where, where are the most exciting developments 
in which community ownership is demonstrating pathways to alternative climate friendly food systems. It seems like there is an opportunity to shake up the industrial agricultural model via community control of the many assets required to bring food from farm to fork. So there are some structural issues there, but there's some very localized issues there as well. So quite, quite interested to get your views with regard to that. I'm gonna to come to you first, Will, because a lot of your uh, work at Bridge End, I think, is very much um, and it's it's captured, I think, in the in the report, is is around that relationship between individuals and food and where it comes from, and, and just just different dimensions of that. And I just wonder if you'd maybe like to say a little bit about that, and, and maybe reflect, obviously, on the question that Adam uh, raises as well. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can mostly just speak from our experience, but there's obviously many, you know, many many projects working in this kind of areas. So. Um, <coughs> Bridgend um, Farmer sits at the entrance to Craig Miller Castle Park and it's uh, uh, and um, Bridgend Organic Allotments is right by it as well. So, you know, right from the beginnings, there was this feeling that you could um, bring together social and environmental justice. It was it was a kind of it was it was cited at a good place and opportunity to do that. Um, and in between sort of three quite densely populated um, housing um, areas in Edinburgh. So, um, you know, the. That at the heart of it was about trying to create a natural relationship between these things, um, between the allotments, between food grown there, uh, between community developments. Um, I suppose for us, you know, often the first point is about um, addressing some of the impact of inequalities, disadvantage, so you know, isolation, um, mental health, and 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 these things can then be done through community gardening or all the other things that we have, you know bike repair, um, building our bothy, um, you know, upcycling. So they're, they're often kind of means to an end in the sense that they're about, um, you know, creating positive opportunities for people to be part of a community. Um, but whilst doing that, creating these discussions um, around sustainability and around climate action. Um, I think those micro level um, projects where people are very actively involved um, is is the kind of thing we, where it would then create societal change on a broader level because you could see where you can actively make a difference um, and and be part of that. Um, Donna, who I think is on here, um, did a fantastic job. Donna Ricardo, who from the Real Junk Food Project and worked with Bridge End for a couple of years in in creating a real community food hub around Bridge End, which then allowed it um, to become a sort of emergency response you know sort of center and and that you know that's the kind of resilience you saw across many many projects in scotland that i think has enabled it to, to be the case i think to extend that is a bigger thing and, and it could be really exciting and i know there's developments in north edinburgh um for some sort of community farm um being discussed at the moment um and um yeah i i just think if you start on that local level then it really builds and people feel involved and and as it was said in the report, other people who trust them and know them, family members, friends, become involved and it just it just ripples out in a much more sustainable way. Absolutely. And th thanks very much for, for, for that. Well, very well said. And, and that point about the localised nature of it and, and, and the ripple effect is, is very, very important in all of this, clearly. Um, can I invite any other colleagues in the panel to, to um, share their thoughts as well? Maybe about the, the local, but maybe the, the structural issue as well. Hamish. Yeah, just building on what Will was saying there, I think one of the things I find most exciting in this kind of area is the is the opportunities in urban communities um, in relation to food growing and some of the connections that are being made. I mean, as as Will's just kind of articulated really well there, some some of the connections um, between food poverty and and social connection in in urban communities, and you know, I think I'll I'll, link, I'll make the link to um, to the vacant and derelict land um, opportunity. Um, and you know, so so many sites in the heart of communities that are really, um, really having a, an, an effect on communities in terms of the sense of place and well-being. Um, and we're we're seeing uh, several examples, you know, across across Scotland now of, of communities turning those sites into really active food growing um, places in all sorts of different ways. Um, so I think there's a there's a huge opportunity there to turn some of the most damaging sites in the heart of communities into some really productive um, food growing sites. And I think the the other thing that I would just throw into the mix is the the potential of the technology change. And and you look at the the vertical farming system that the James Hutton Institute are developing, for example, that could turn on its head many of the land use choices that we're faced with making at the moment. 
um, and, and you know, could be a real disruptor um, with, with huge um, huge benefits in this context. No, very much so. That could have a really transformative effect, as you say, Hamish, definitely. Um, I'm conscious of time, but does anybody else want to leap in on, on this particular question before we, we move on to the next one? Donald, you'll have something just, to... a, just a quick one there. Um, I, I think that um, there, there's possibly a role for crofting on, in, in this discussion as well. Um, and one, one thing that SAF have been calling for for a long time, but it's 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 come up again recently, is the, the creation of new crofts. Um, and it's, it's something that I think the the community land sector could get involved in as well um, and publicly owned land too. Um, I think the discussion around the creation of new crofts is often focused on crofting estates which can often be difficult to create crofts out of uh, common grazings where most of the, the good land has already been put into crofts but I think we need to expand our view of that onto other land, land that isn't in crofting tenure at the moment and, and even in, in discussions um, recently talking about actually could could crofting be a model extended across the the whole of Scotland uh, and, I, and I think that there, that there would be a massive opportunity then for um, community owned land in the, in the rest of the country particularly um, in, in the south of Scotland and I see Jamie McIntyre has mentioned that in the chat about the expansion of woodland crofts in that setting and and it gives that opportunity for people to have that um, opportunity to grow their own food um, uh, or manage a woodland and de definitely plenty potential there for the future. Absolutely and you're of course right and we would expect nothing else but you're right to mention uh, the, the, the really important role of crofting in all of this as well clearly that's very very important. I want to move on to a question now from Sarah uh, Pimenta that uh, talks about or she, she, she wants to know it's uh, Specifically, was there any scrutiny of the extent of the social inclusivity of the community groups uh, with, um, with regard to minority groups within communities in terms of the research? I'm assuming this is the case. And I think this is such a really important point with regard to uh, just ensuring that um, everybody's voice is heard in terms of um, a, these debates around land and land ownership and, and, and the, the inclusivity or otherwise of that. So can I just pass over to, to Chris, who's with us as well, or indeed Bobby, and, and say, was, was, did that come through in, in any of the research at all? Um, I mean, the direct answer to the question is that we, we didn't, uh, we didn't scrutinise, scrutinise that. It wasn't a question that we were asking through this piece of research. So it's not something that we, um, we had a particular focus on. I'll maybe just say a couple of things around it though. And then Bobby, I mean, you, you may want to also uh, say something as well. I mean, firstly, we, we in, in terms of the our definition of community owners in this, this research, which is set out in the report, uh, we chose only to look at um, uh, organisations which have an open membership, you know, for everyone in, in a certain geographical area is one of the key criteria. So, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other part I make is that I think while it wasn't an explicit question we were asking, I think, again, some of the case studies and some of the um, examples um, that are given in the report as well, I do speak to that. I mean, one when I was reading the question the chat, one that sprung to mind was the Abraham Forest Trust case study. It's maybe worth a look in terms of the work that Abraham are doing, not just with the local community, but for for many people from from wider afield who are um, using the forest. Um, you know, people seeking employment, people who've had experience of the criminal justice system, uh, people with various kind of uh, mental health issues, and so on. So there are examples in there. I think of some of the kind of positive work that community owners are doing, but. Yes, I Bobby, I don't know if there's anything you had your head more in the data than me, you might know um, have more to say on that. Yeah, I mean, sim similar themes, um, as well as breaking, um, I mean, Clear in, in Buckhaven and Methyl uh, had a specific focus on, on working in, in a community that has really had a hard time of it over the years uh, and, and really trying to regenerate and bring people in uh, to, to the kind of regeneration of of that community. Um, I'd also say that in terms of the, the survey and, and the follow-up emails, we asked people about the benefits, um, kind of other community benefits that this climate action might bring. And, and the two things that were really coming through strongly across all climate related activity was around um, an increase in, in community and voluntary activity um, within, you know, a, a, as a result of this community climate action and also increased community cohesion. Uh, and so within the, the emails, we tried to get under how 
climate action can increase community cohesion, but it tended to be around people coming together around a project. So, uh, w as Chris said, we didn't ask specifically um, about, you know, how, how to make sure that that organization is, is representative and, and bring everyone around, but there were indications that that, that, that was the effect of, of some of these activities and initiatives. Will, please. Um, yeah, just to say on, just to say a couple of things on that. Um, I mean, I, I, there is, there is in an urban context, you know, there's lots of projects in that sense. I'm aware of a couple that come to mind. Score Scotland, who are based the West Hills, um, who who are particularly, do, you know, doing work around um, uh, supporting people from minority ethnic backgrounds, linking it into climate change work and, and the welcoming. And I think for an anchor organisation or a community landowner like like ourselves, I suppose it's about trying to create those partnerships, which was mentioned in the report, you know, so that um, we can utilize this land or this facility um, for groups who have those existing relationships. So to diversify the involvement of people in an urban context, you know, there's quite a lot of different groups. But the other point I, I suppose around um, inclusivity I'm thinking of is children, you know, and, and sometimes often over, overlooked to the rot. And, but, but, but within this context, you know, seen as a, is a powerful force, you know, Fridays for the Future, um, the, the, the strikes and, um, you know, Greta and all this stuff. And, and, I, and I know the Children's Parliament's done a, a great bit of work around that and um, children there asking for all community landowners to be planting more trees. And I, I feel like there's a good bit of involvement there to, to, to engage with children who, you know, who see this um, as their future um, and, and, and more what could be done with them. And I, I would like to see more pretend, you know, no, it's so important to raise that in terms of, of, of that diverse range of voices and, and, and children's voices, of course, f fundamentally important in all, all of this and, and how you engage with them is, is uh, critical uh, in that regard. Th thanks, Will. I'm conscious of the time. I said we'd be finishing at five o'clock. We will finish just about on five o'clock. But um, there are a number of other questions which we just don't have time to respond to directly at the event just now. But what we will do um, with the hopefully with the, the agreement of our, our colleagues the, on the panel is we will um, consider them after the event and, and send uh, some responses with regard to them for those of the questions that haven't been answered. So we will come back to them. They will not be lost in the ether at all. Um, but I, I just want to thank the panelists for what I think has been a really uh, rich and quite diver very diverse, in fact, um, discussion and conversation around, of, around so many interconnected issues with regard to uh, that relationship between community, land and the climate emergency and how we address uh, these very knotty and challenging issues and where the opportunities lie there as well. But to, to finish off, I just want to invite Ailsa as uh, Community Land Scotland's chair to, to close with just a, a, a few final reflections on uh, what you've heard and, and, and where we might go next, Ailsa, in relation to this whole pressing, urgent and challenging uh, agenda that we all collectively face. Thank you. Thanks, Callum, and thank you so much to all the panel and everyone that's posed questions um, today. Um, there's, there's lots for us to, to think about, uh, go away and think about there. Um, I wrote down loads of reflections, um, but I've only got a minute. So just to, uh, two or three principal ones. I, I think the, the, the point that Nicholas made um, at the start and this quote from Arundhati Roy was, was really powerful. This is a really timely report and I think we've all been working towards this and it's come out obviously at the same time as the just transition com um, commission report and the climate change assembly report and and then the build up to COP and we've now got a chance to really demonstrate how communities should be part of that mainstream response to climate um, action. Um, so uh, hopefully the report will be able to demonstrate the critical role that the community led activity must play in a just transition to net zero absolutely critical. Um, a couple of the, the, the things that really struck me from the film was Sally and, and Donald from Carlaway Sally talking about how their community is so closely connected to the climate um, and Donald talking about the small scale changes which change individuals people's lives um, and that's what the communities are really good at but their community their cumulative effect, too many communities, cumulative effect leads to global change and I think that's what we've really got to be focusing on. Um, so just, just finishing up with a couple of the points that, um, that Hamish made um, is that we know the next decade is going to be a huge decade of change in all sorts of ways um, and how do we make the most of that for our communities and, and for the people of Scotland and not let them get left behind um, and really importantly the leadership role for the community land sector, you know, we've demonstrated 
demonstrated we've got real skills and expertise in the sector um, in all sorts of ways and how do we make sure that we can share that expertise more widely not only in the sector itself but more broadly within agencies and Scottish Government and how can we influence that scale of change I think would be really important so just to thank everyone again for, for coming um, it's been a really great turnout and we've really enjoyed putting the report together um, and you know we commend you all to go in have a really good read through it and certainly come back with any questions um, so thanks again everybody see you all soon Yes, thanks very much indeed, everyone. Really do appreciate you taking the time and effort to engage with the, the, this event and with the, the whole process. Thanks to the panellists, thanks to Chris and Bobby, obviously, and to Nicholas uh, for their input. Thanks to everyone who's registered and, and asked questions and just listened in. Let's keep the conversations going. Let's keep the action going as well. There's a big challenge here for all of us, uh, but there's there's much to do. But we, we certainly have, a, as this research shows, an important role for community land owners, urban and rural, to, to help address this overarching uh, challenge that we all face in terms of the climate emergency. So thanks very much. Uh, wish you good evening, and I'm sure we will all reconnect again sooner rather than later, hopefully in, in person, but certainly in, in some form before then. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.